So where is this opportunity? Now, typically in, you know, in the old world of traditional retailing, if you were looking to expand, you went to near to home markets. So if you're an American retailer, you typically started in Canada, for example, or if you're British, you started in you know, France or Germany. Actually, e-commerce and technology now open up the whole world to any business. And certainly when we've looked at the sales profiles of a lot of the businesses whose names uh, you know, we just quoted, you see a very broad spread of markets that they are serving. And you know, there's a cluster here, which is what you would call the major markets, right? You've got to have a point of view on USA, France, and Germany, which those three add up. And actually, if the UK were on this map, that's where the UK would sit as well. Those three slash four countries are the top four markets for e-commerce uh, in the world. So clearly, you need to have a point of view for how your brand will travel there. But equally, we were really quite excited and interested in the smaller cluster here. It's worth less overall, but actually uh, almost a bit of a quick win. These countries that we call the accessible Anglophones. So they're the Scandinavian countries, Holland, um, Austria, Australia, Canada, etc. And actually, the reason they're really accessible is pretty much a lot of the businesses that we spoke to felt that they could take their current offer without really changing language, without really making too many tweaks, and it would work in those markets. So actually, tremendously easy to uh, occupy that sort of, or access those markets. Um, one of the CEOs we talked to said that, you know, they were trying to drive the business in Sweden, and so they said, right, we've got to translate the website into Swedish, which they did. And actually, the conversion just dropped. Uh, and it was because Swedish customers didn't really want to be shopping from a Swedish site, absolutely comfortable in English. So that's kind of probably a good example of you know, markets that are easy to access. Uh, there's another cluster here uh, where probably requires some bit of language tailoring, but we call them the nascent neighbors. They're very easy to ship to. It's not operationally too complex, kind of so bar the language issue or the language localization, actually a lot of these markets are, relatively speaking, quite easy to uh, ship and serve. And then, of course, last but not the least, you've got this cluster here. Um, you know, a few years ago, everyone used to say it was all about the BRICS. Today, they probably refer to it as a brick wall. Uh, so clearly, you've got the countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China. You know, again, huge markets, uh, still expected to be in growth, uh, but quite challenging to enter and sort of typically require a very localized approach. Um, so again, you know, we would say think before uh, entering uh, some of those and certainly consider a lot of the other markets that are uh, you know, strategically ready in terms of size and probably you know, much easier to access operationally as well. So really, what does this all mean? Um, our belief is that fundamentally, and this is, says retail, but actually you could replace the word retail with brand uh, or business. Um, and we do think that the rules of internationalization have changed. So typically, a retailer looking to expand internationally would take a multi-year approach. Uh, and today, what we're seeing is brands that are simultaneously growing and expanding in their domestic market and internationally. Um, again, historically, businesses probably went to markets that were close or culturally similar. And again, we're seeing it's actually none of that is really driving where your markets are going to be. It's much more where the traction with customers is. And we've seen a big spread of we've seen businesses where actually um, they started shipping overseas and they found all of, you know, there's a huge uh, trade and traffic to Japan and Australia, and we could have never expected that. We've seen businesses that have suddenly found lots of opportunity in Poland and the Czech Republic. We've seen businesses that end up doing really well in America. Uh, and a lot of these were markets for these businesses w wouldn't have sort of intuitively looked at if they were kind of just opening up through a bricks and mortar presence. And finally, obviously, the risk dimension of this has all changed because going international now is much faster to do and it's a lot less capital intense. You don't need to think about stores and warehouses and distribution in lots of different market. And you can, whether you're a retailer or a brand, you can actually think of a much more um, lower cost and uh, 
capit less capital intense approach to internationalization, which also can be sort of, you can test and trial before you actually go ahead and commit and roll out in full scale. So suddenly it makes the risk dynamics look much more uh, attractive. So the rules we believe have changed. Um, and actually a lot of new winners have been created and will continue to be created out of this. And so really just to end, uh, you know, the five traits of the winners that we've seen. First of all, you know, there is no substitute for a good proposition. Uh, so all of the businesses that we see are doing well fundamentally have great product, great price, great service. So, you know, there's no running away from that. And, uh, you know, if a business isn't quite up to scratch and probably needs some uh, kind of upgrade to the customer experience, that's probably, you know, not the right time to internationalize. But other than that, there's no substitute for a great proposition. Um, the second point probably is a theme that you've heard throughout today. Actually, the winners here are not the ones who have a static worldview of this is the market I want to go into. They're reading the tea leaves, they're reading the data, they're looking at where consumers are and they're following the consumer and they're actually responding and reacting quite rapidly based on actually where is the customer coming from, um, based on how should, be, how should I be pricing based on what the currency is doing today. So certainly we're seeing a group of businesses that is um, really much more data driven and looking at where the customer opportunity is uh, and following that. Also finding a lot of cost effective routes to building awareness and customer volumes, so driving word of mouth and PR um, in, you know, in uh, local countries. In a lot of markets, actually bidding on search tends to be also less com kind of less competed. So often a lot of businesses are finding that the ROI on paid search as well is probably better uh, in some markets. And all of this is, you know, data uh, is easily accessible and you can sort of almost work out the profitability and sort of take a call on uh, where you'd want to go. Um, and most people are really going down to what you would call selective and resource-like localization. So one of the reasons it's easier for this sort of proposition to be more profitable today is that you don't have to go in for extensive sort of local offices in every country, building all of the functions in every country, which can be you know, quite a heavy sort of uh, overhead um, uh, solution, but actually looking at where do I really need to localize and very selectively doing that. So whether it's in customer services or whether it's uh, in uh, translation or whether it's in returns. So being really clear about where are we going to localize and everything else done centrally done once uh, to keep the costs low. And then finally, these are all businesses that have really sort of figured out actually how do I attract customers and how do I make sure that the order economics are uh, you know, attractive and I'm able to drive retention and loyalty and bring customers back to me again and again. So again, we were, hopefully this was a um, quick but interesting uh, sort of walkthrough. If you're interested in any more details, please do sort of get in touch with uh, Finton or Peter from Google or myself. We'd be happy to sort of uh, uh, do any more, sort of take you through any more sort of detailed findings. But certainly we think if you're a brand today and not think, thinking about your digital presence in a much more international way, uh, you're probably not doing the right thing by your customers because customers are searching globally uh, and the internet is really the global shop window. Thank you.